as people are joining, I'm going to just introduce myself and talk for a moment about the Long Term Ecological Research Network and the Synthesis webinar series. Uh, welcome to the 2021 Long Term Ecological Research Network Synthesis webinar series. We're hearing over the next uh, five or six months from each of the synthesis working groups that was selected and funded in 2019 and 2020. Uh, we can call them the COVID cohort, I guess, since many of them have yet to meet in person. Uh, I'm Marty Downs. I direct the Long-Term Ecological Research Network uh, Network Office and organize the synthesis series. The group that we're going to be hearing from today is the Soil Organic Matter Working Group, which was funded in 2017 and has uh, had a chance to at least almost complete their work before COVID hit. So they've uh, they have more products than some of the other synthesis groups that we'll be hearing from. Uh, the network office selects and supports cohorts of synthesis groups every couple of years, and we uh, work both the ideas and the data are certainly not limited to, uh, to within LTER sites. We ask that synthesis groups draw on data from at least two sites, but they can also draw on, as you'll certainly see today, from many sources, both inside and outside of the network. Um, our next opportunity for funding synthesis groups will be in the fall of 2022, and we were looking forward to a great crop of ideas at that time. Uh, Will Weeder, who's presenting today, is a project scientist at the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, and his work focuses on incorporating ecology into Earth system models. Um, Eric Pearson is a postdoc at Idaho University, Idaho State University, and came before that from the Forest Service and did his PhD at Oregon State University. And um, I think with that, I will stop sharing. And oh, uh, let me just give you a few logistics first. Um, Derek and Will will present, and uh, everyone can ask questions by using the QA function at the usually available in the menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, that Q&A function allows people to upvote questions and you can enter questions there throughout the webinar and Derek and Will will take them at the end of the webinar. Um, I think with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Will. Thanks, Marty. Can you enable share screen sharing for me? Oh, I'm sorry, it should be enabled already. Um, There it goes. Cool. You guys see this okay? We can indeed. Great. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, my video works now too. Cool. Um, great. Yeah, so I'm Will Weeder, and along with Derek Pearson, I'd like to present work from our LTER soil synthesis soil carbon synthesis work. Um, Kate Loida was the other co-PI on this project um, and Stephen Earle was really critical to getting a lot of the work that I'll present today done. Um, and, and then everyone else that was in the working group. So we had uh, close to 30 people that ended up contributing um, and it ended up being, I think a pretty successful and pretty fun um, project. So I wanna talk a little bit about um, what we're calling SODA. I have to move zoom things around so I can actually see the screen that you guys are seeing. Um, so the soil, <clears throat> SODA is the soil data harmonization. And originally we started SODA really just as a database, but it's kind of grown um, to offer some more tools and really a framework for doing synthesis that I think has is, is been useful for our working group and is hopefully um, useful for, other, for others as well. Um, so if you're not a soil biogeochemist, um, I think one of the motivations for our work is that it's just soil, soils store carbon um, and they store a lot of carbon. So there's more carbon in soils globally than there is in all of the vegetation and all of the atmosphere combined. And so for those of us that like thinking about soil and soil carbon, um, you know, that just that the sheer volume of carbon that's in soils and, and 
biologically available, at least at, at kind of centennial timescales, is is quite large. And soils are also the 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 only source basically of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other micronutrients that, that you know life needs to grow on Earth, um, at least on the terrestrial biosphere. So from a biogeochemical perspective, soils are are an interesting place to work. Um, but the way that we typically represent soils in models, especially large scale models that are used for climate change predictions, um, kind of belies their complexity. Um, so typically, soil biogeochemical models represent um, pools of carbon that represent fast or slow pools and fluxes of CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, so here, those fast pools are represented by candy bars that might disappear off your porch in a couple of weeks relatively quickly. Um, whereas slower pools are chemically more recalcitrant, um, not as yummy and tasty for soil microbes to eat, and so sit around for longer. Um, and that that theory is kind of the de facto null hypothesis that goes into um, again many of the models that are used for climate change predictions. But um, those theories have changed a lot in the last couple of decades and literally been turned on their head. So now. Um, the quote unquote fast pool is fast, not necessarily because it's more chemically labile, um, but because it's not physically protected. And so what actually makes soil carbon persist for a long amount of time isn't necessarily that it's um, biochemically recalcitrant, but more that it's protected from degradation. Um, either it's occluded in aggregates or it's um, bound up on mineral surfaces. And so the, the the kind of biogeochemical dynamics of how we think about soils has really changed. Um, again, this is just really in the last 20 years. And, and microbes really are at the center of that. So, um, so the chemistry of, of soil organic matter matters. Um, the catalyst is important and ca the catalyst here is soil microorganisms and then the soil conditions, um, which again is relates to you know, things like pH or soil bio, um, soil physical properties. And so um, here the kind of the bio in biogeochemistry is really at the center um, of how we think soil carbon is transformed and also persists. Um, but there's also obviously a role for, for the geology and the under, and underlying geology, as well as the chemistry of the substrates. And so um, another synthesis that I was involved with um, was at the Powell Center and, and became the ISRAD project. But one of the early products that came out of ISRAD was this um, triangle paper, we called it, that Joey Blankenship led a couple of years ago. And the idea here is that there's these emerging soil carbon paradigms that are, are kind of being pulled at the vertices of this triangle. So new measurements um, are being taken that help develop new theories about how soil carbon is persistent in soils and that insights, those insights are being applied increasingly into models that are used for large scale, um, large scale projections. And so one of the ideas behind our, our synthesis was trying to use synthesis to, to help rebalance this triangle as the, as the nodes are getting pulled in different ways. Um, can we use synthesis to start to, to realign our measurements theory and models as it, as it relates to soil, soil organic matter? Um, so the aims were to use synthesis across research networks to fill in both knowledge and data gaps. And so because we're focusing on synthesis, it's really these two axes related to measurements and theory and measurements and models. Um, and what I have here is just a, a map of the conterminous US showing where all of the CZO, DIRT, LTER, NEON, and NetNet sites are. And so we set out to to take these five, you know, largely NSF funded networks um, and try to put all of those data together. And for my research, especially to look at how um, measurements can both inform the parameterization and then the validation of models that are used for, for continental and global scale predictions. And so we came into our synthesis knowing that the all of the networks that we were interested in had kind of a, a history and a, a landscape of strengths. Um, and so networks like LTER really focus more on ecological dynamics as well as disturbances um, and include things like you know, repeated measurements and long-term manipulations. Um, similarly, networks like 
the nutrient network and DIRT, which is the DIRT detrital input and removal treatment, um, really focus on, on disturbance and manipulations, whereas other networks like NEON have broad data coverage and standardized measurement practices that are advantageous. Um, and then other networks like the CZO really focus more on deep soils and deep time. And so this is work that um, Samantha Weintraub led as part of a kind of a preliminary workshop that was held at NEON about a year before our, our team got to meet for the first time. Um, but I think it was useful in contextualizing where SODA sits and how we're trying to bring the strengths of these networks all together. Um, this is what it looks like once you actually synthesize the data, and I apologize. Um, this is, is not necessarily meant to be highly readable, but you can see that um, these, these ideas that we have about where the networks fall kind of play out here. So CZO, the original uh, version of CZO didn't have a ton of sites, not a ton of length in terms of their data coverage, but they do have um, a wealth of information about soil, carp soil measurements at depth. Um, Whereas DIRT also has a relatively limited number of sites, but um, has been around some of the sites for as long as 50 years. So this is a much longer time record, um, but they really focus just on surface soils. So not, not so much in depth. Whereas sites like LTER extend back even longer. Um, some of LTER sites have, you know, measurements going back into the seventies um, and kind of, you know, down to as much of a meter in depth. Whereas NEON has much broader spatial coverage um, and measurements down to down to two meters depth in their megapit samples. And then finally, NutNet um, has measurements all over the world, uh, but they're you know a mile wide and, and actually just five centimeters deep. Um, so they they really again just focus on, on the surface soils. But synthesizing data to finally be able to make a figure like that. Um, took quite a, quite a bit of work. And so I kind of want to give a, a nod to the work that Stephen Earl and Derek Pearson were really critical in, in, in helping with. Um, and we kind of used all of the tools that many of us are familiar working with now, um, you know, so Slack and GitHub, um, Zoom, Google Drive, and, and R were kind of critical to this, being able to take um, data sets that kind of look like this cartoon on the left and, and harmonizing and aggregating them into you know, something that was tidy and more usable, more like the cartoon on the right. Um, and one of the things that was really important to me was to do this in a scripted, repeatable, and extensible format. Um, and I'll talk some about how we did that and, and why it was important coming up. And so um, to accomplish this, we first had to identify data, then work on harmonization and, ag and aggregation. Um, next, we focused on visualization, and then finally the analyses that we could do with this data set that we put together. Um, and again, trying to do this in a scripted and repeatable fashion. Um, and so to, to do this kind of first step, and this is, I think, where the magic of SODA really comes through is in, in again, in this harmonization and aggregation step. So um, we had data providers on our team, you know, basically one representing um, a site or a network um, provide raw data. And they linked that with this metadata template that I'll talk about um, in a little bit what's on the metadata template. And so those two products together um, then could be run through a soil harmonization script, um, which put out a harmonized data file as well as some QA, QC plots and notes about the harmonization. And then after we did that for a number of sites, we could aggregate all of those data um, into a flat CSV file, um, which is this level two data product that contains the aggregate, aggregated soil data set. Um, and on top of that, then we layered on some visualization and analysis scripts. Um, the, and again, I keep harping on this, the scripted, repeatable, and extensible. Um, it's been critical. The scripted and repeatable part was was really critical as we realized um, you know things that we missed in the terms of our metadata collection, um, and then having it be repeatable really facilitated the addition of adding new sites um, more easily to the to the database, and then extensible so that we could include new data products as they become available. And Derek will talk a little bit about how he's done that um, with with work that he's extended on. So the metadata template was really inspired by ISCN um, via ISRAD. And so it takes a whole bunch of data that we put into two 
tabs in a CSV file that just are, or I'm sorry, on a, on a Google sheet that relate to the location data. So this is things like the name of the person who's entering the data, as well as the network and the site that you're working at. Um, and then more profile data that have information about, um, you know, what kind of experiment the data are in, when the data were collected, and then information about the different layers um, in a soil profile. So you might have data at one location that has, you know, two soil cores that were taken out of surface soils, whereas at another location, you've got a, you know, more of a profile type measurement with discrete measurements taken either by horizon or by, um, by depth. Um, and the way this works practically, I'm not going to belie all the details here too much, um, but we did this all in, in Google Drive, mostly just because it was an easy place to share data, although it really made some of the R scripting a challenge on the back end. Um, I'd be happy to address questions about that, or Stephen can. Um, it was both, you know, I think a strength and a curse of our approach. Um, you know, but data providers could make a file folder for their site. Here's an example from Bonanza Creek. In it, they dropped the raw data as well as this metadata template. And then the metadata template, they'd have to go through manually and add in information about, um, you know, basically what the headers were, what the column names were in their raw data, and then how that mapped on to, to the harmonized data set that we would ultimately make in the end. So after we generated those level one data, um, a separate script would go through and aggregate all of the data um, to produce what's now the published aggregated SOTA data set that's available on EDI. Um, kind of in closing, I, in moving on from just the nuts and bolts of how we did the synthesis, uh, aspects of this were still kind of too manual and hard. I think it, it's a big step forward compared to you know, the way that ISRAD had to do the, the synthesis of radiocarbon data that they pulled together. Um, but I think it, it still um, leaves some this manual step of entering um, entering at data in the metadata template was is is still time consuming, um, and, but I also don't see that improving without having a standardized ontology and improved metadata on the raw data that we're reading in. Um, I think that this kind of manual step is 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 what we're stuck with for now. And so, what do we have? Um, We've got data from 190 sites with 400 unique locations, which corresponds to over 360,000 rows of observation in the harmonized data set, which is just kind of a phenomenal amount of data to try to figure out what to do with. Um, and so we created some visualization tools, um, notably the Shiny app that NCS is hosting for us right now um, that Derek created. And I'll and, and I think the Shiny app is, is another one of the things that really makes SOTA stand out in terms of its usability and, and approachableness um, for ways that users can start to wrap their head around the data that are actually available. And so Derek um, gets all of the credit for making the Shiny app. Um, and this is just a screenshot showing what's out there, but there's um, you know ways that you can select different layers, um, select different analytes, select different depths and networks to say, you know, like, you know, I, I'm really only interested in CCO data, or I really just want to look at LTER, um, and, and different ways of filtering the data that are, are kind of nice and slick. Um, and then also some plotting, you know, just some simple plotting approaches. So this is um, soil carbon as shown as a percent for a whole bunch of different sites um, colored by network. Um, and so again, you're not really supposed to see this, but it's just to say like, whoa, there's a lot of soil carbon data in the, in the data set. Um, so we have a few other tools that I think are, are useful for people that are interesting and interested in accessing data. So besides the Shiny app, which just kind of gives you a quick visual of the data that are there. <clears throat> um, we also have a website that provides information about um, the you know history of the of the working group as well as some of the um, projects that were that were uh, that are ongoing or completed, um, and then we also have a GitHub repository with some sample scripts that should let people start accessing the data and and asking questions that that seem interesting. 
And so it took us at least two meetings, um, in-person meetings, plus a lot of work on the backside to actually get the data set put together. And then we got to spend our third meeting, which was about two years ago, um, saying, okay, now that we've spent a year and a half putting this data set together, what questions can we actually answer with it? And I'm just gonna talk about the first two of these, um, which is work that one of which has been published and the other one, which was which is ongoing, but we've kind of identified some low hanging fruit of things, of products to, to look at with the database. And so the first of these is work that Kat Giorgio did, um, and it was published this year in Biogeochemistry. She actually wasn't using observations from the SOTA database, but instead from the WOSIS data set, which is the data set that goes into making the harmonized world soils database, as well as other soil products. So it's soil profile data um, gathered from around the world. Um, so what Kat found with a, she used a random forest machine learning approach to look at what are the relative controls over soil carbon stocks. And she hypothesized that there was kind of three predominant controls that so could be productivity, could be climate with here, which she approximated with mean annual temperature, or it could be um, more soil properties here, which she approximated with soil texture, so sand, silt, and clay. Um, and what she found is that soil texture is really kind of a dominant control over soil carbon stocks from the WOSIS data set. And that's true even for more extrapolated data sets. So for the Harmonized World Soils database, um, that predominance of texture is really important. But then for these three models that I'm not gonna go into the details of, but for CASA, the CASA model, the MIMICS model and CORPS model, um, they really underestimate the importance of soil properties, like, or again here, texture in terms of controlling the stocks that are simulated. So what Kat's work highlights is that there's this kind of fundamental mismatch, even with these newer models, um, in terms of the relative importance that they place on things like climate and productivity, um, as opposed to soil properties and controlling soil carbon stocks. So um, some useful work from, from a machine learning approach. And then this is more of just a descriptive study um, that Emily Kiker Snowman, who's a newly minted PhD student out of um, the University of New Hampshire, has been working on looking at controls over soil carbon stoichiometry. So the slope of these lines basically give you soil C to N ratios, or really soil N to C ratios. Um, so more nitrogen rich soils will be um, kind of up here and more carbon rich soils will be down here. And so what Emily found is that there's these really kind of um, surprising, at least to me, trends that can be largely described, again, by soil properties here, clay and pH, um, where more basic soils and also um, more finely textured soils tend to have higher, lower C to N ratios, so more nitrogen relative to carbon, um, than do more acidic soils or um, more coarsely textured soils. Um, so again, this is kind of more insights that we can apply into models. Um, moving forward. So there's still some remaining challenges. Um, I think one of the challenges of doing any kind of soil synthesis is that there's too many um, too many things that we have to try, to try to account for. So we're looking at things like climate, vegetation, productivity, litter chemistry, and, and roots, if, if at all possible. Then on top of that, we're interested in looking at soil chemical and physical properties. You know, if it's carbon that we're after, um, these are all the covariates that we need to think about. Um, Depth is the biggest thing that changes soil carbon, uh, changes, you know, changes with, with of carbon with depth are, are larger than they are across space. Um, so that's an important covariate. And then we also are looking at manipulations and time series. And these are from data that are collected, you know, maybe from experimental manipulations. Um, you know, here kind of a randomized block design. They might be collected up and down hill slope catenas um, or along transects, or they might be scattered kind of, um, you know, not randomly, but, uh, you know, underneath, you know, vegetation, you know, whether it's a, a bush, a shrub, a grass, or kind of the inner space. So, um, which presents a whole lot of challenges in terms of thinking about how to aggregate those data um, and how to both align data sets that aren't that aren't vertically aligned in our flat data set or handle the averaging um, and so we're still kind of working on ways to handle um, you know aggregating data appropriately for all these you know, different things that are being collected at different times and in different ways um, across multiple sites but we've had <clears throat> i would say some success in terms of getting papers out um, so one sharon billings led which was more 
uh, just kind of emphasizing the importance of soil organic carbon, not just for you know studies of pedology, but in, or for soil science, but it's really uh, important for a number of ecosystem studies. Um, Samantha Leff and I led a, a special issue that was published in Biogeochemistry earlier this year, which included um, Cat's paper um, that that also came out as part of that special issue, and then the database presentation paper also came out in Earth System Science data. Uh, also earlier this year. So we have a number of other products that um, that have, I think, been important for, for SOTA. So the, mo the biggest one of those was having the, the SOTA database published in EDI, as well as our scripts to analyze the database that are available on GitHub. Again, there's the Shiny app and website that kind of introduce users to, to, to the data set and, and provide some easy tools to access it. Um, and then again, Samantha and I have organized a AGU special session on soil data, especially focusing on networks and long-term data that I think is in its third or fourth year now. Um, so it's, it's um, getting quite mature, which is exciting. And then that led to this biogeochemistry special issue that came out earlier this year. And then <clears throat> Derek's going to talk about some of the other um, ways that we're using this. So he's applied it to work that he's doing right now at Reynolds Creek during his postdoc. Um, and then there's also interest from the CZN, the, the geomicrobial, geomicrobial CZN, um, as well as conversations with LTAR, PNNL, and then also um, USDA provided a, a small amount of funding to do some model integration because both our synthesis as well as the ISRAD synthesis said that, that you know modeling was an important part of the work that they would do but uh, at least so far in both of those products just putting the database together has kind of eaten up all of our time and so it's nice to have a little bit of support um, to to start applying those insights into models so with that um, I'll leave this up um, as Derek kind of gets ready, but you know, I think one of the things that SOTA does is help to alleviate the synthesis bottleneck. Um, it's not, it's still not super straightforward, but at least does provide a scripted and repeatable way to take you know diverse measurements from multiple sites um, and and harmonize them in a in a way that's that's hopefully usable for folks. So I think we're gonna uh, wait and have questions at the end. But Derek, if you want to share your screen, and if folks want to add questions to the um, Q and A, yeah, thanks, Will. The uh, Derek and Will together will take questions uh, at the end of the the presentation. But please feel free to add questions into the chat as you think of them, as they, or I'm sorry, into the Q and A, uh, as you think of them as they come up in the course of the presentation. I much appreciate that. You ready to go, Derek? Yeah. So, Great. Hello, everyone. Um, so as Will mentioned, I'm going to kind of discuss um, some of the things that have come after the, the working group and um, some work that I've led kind of repurposing this framework we put together, really building further off of that kind of repeatable and extensible idea. Um, and it's really, you know, as we finished up with the project, it became very clear that we had we had achieved what we set out to, that we could really um, with minor changes, use soda to synthesize most any data we wanted to. Um, so as I finished up my PhD and I was looking for where to go next, um, I kind of landed at Idaho State University and they had some, some kind of goals of synthesizing data and modeling. It was really this very similar project as to what we bit off with the original soda um, project for all the networks and bigger sites. Just this one was really kind of collapsed down to just one site. Um, but again, a wide array of data that they needed to bring together in order to kind of do some, some larger modeling, some larger science. And then at the end, I'll, I'll mention a little bit about this other project, which is kind of this next step beyond what we've done at Reynolds Creek, another opportunity we have to use soda again. Uh, so a little bit about Reynolds Creek. Reynolds Creek is this, um, it's an experimental watershed in southwestern Idaho. Um, and its hallmark is really that it's, it's a semi-arid ecosystem, but it's this huge environmental gradient. So you have this, this really arid, dry, sagebrush landscape at the bottom of the valley, and then spreads all the way up to Aspen and Juniper and Douglas fir stands at the higher elevations. Um, so it's a really awesome place to kind of study soil carbon dynamics because you have these huge differences in climate and vegetation. 
um, and soils as well. It, um, the underlying geology is quite diverse. So as I was brought onto this project for Reynolds Creek, there really it, it was kind of this this blank check of what I wanted to do. It had two main goals: one, synthesize all of this data from grad students and scientists for the past twenty years or so, so it's not just archived; it's actually harmonized and synthesis and available for for myself and others to to use um, in in kind of more big big data ways, um, more active ways currently. So this fit in great with soda. This is you know kind of how I sold myself, probably how I got the job. Um, and it's uh, only about 20 data sets. Uh, Jim, I saw your question on there about how long this takes. I think this process is really a good representation. The, the original um, SOTA framework took us a long time because we were building it at the same time we were putting data into it. So um, this process, granted, I have a, a very in-depth knowledge of, of the framework, but took me a couple of weeks to, to get all these data set key files put in, make some adjustments that were needed. And we have the database for Reynolds Creek. Um, containing, you know, a, as much data as we could get our hands on. And in doing so, that the great part about that is as we reuse it, we're also able to improve it and adapt it. So there's certain things that needed some adjustment. Reynolds Creek had um, environmental data that we didn't account for in the original um, framework. So we had to go back and figure out ways to, to better um, input and change the, the possible data variables within SOTA. Um, and then also some some new work on you know I updated the app we're kind of up to to the new shiny app with some some fancier features and a little bit better look and capabilities and whatnot and also how do we aggregate the data and whatnot on the part about quantifying soil sea stocks that it was again this, this blank check of we just want to quantify soil sea map soil sea across watershed we we're going to do something and. After synthesizing the data, it was this big, okay, uh, how do we want to do this? We've got, you know, flux tower data, we've got 300 soil pits, we've got climate data, we have spatial data and all these other studies, you know, it really, really is everything at our fingertips that the universities and government agencies and whatnot have, have done for the many decades. And, and how do we kind of fold all of that together to, to do the best we can in terms of modeling and estimating and projecting soil carbon stocks at, at this experimental ocean. Um, and it, it kind of, the, the issue we still had, despite synthesizing all of this data for SOTA, is that we still needed more data to, to run a model like MIMICS. Um, we needed, you know, soil temperatures and AMPP and clay and lignin and, and things that weren't necessarily measured at every sampling point that we wanted to use and for, for estimating soil carbon. So this project led to this further kind of combination of the, the tabular soda database with then inputting and bringing in um, data out of spatial, data, um, spatial layers that were available to us. And once we had those two pieces, then we're really at that point where we, we have the, the forcing data, we have the tables we need to run a, a, a system model, in this case, MIMICS. So using the MIMICS model, and we have all this data, now that we're really able to realize the fact that we can harness all the data from Reynolds Creek, led to some really great opportunities. So with the data, we decided to go after kind of a machine learning based approach. So as the, the one thing to know about machine learning is you really have to have a lot of data. It doesn't work unless you, you have, you know, tens, hundreds of points that you can really inform your, your machine learning algorithms with. So in this case, we had that. And what we were able to do with it is find the best parameterization of MIMICS. So MIMICS being a process based model, it's the estimates and projections are heavily, heavily dependent on the parameters in the model that control the, the flow of carbon from input to microbial processing to soil organic matter and mineral stabilization. All of these things have, have rate limiters and different functions that control how that soil carbon is passed from one pool to, another, to the next. And parameterized, setting those parameters remains the key challenge um, kind of right up front when you run a model like MIMICS. So we are able to use machine learning to fully identify the best parameterization and also kind of keep it within the bounds for those processes, those theorized and known limits that we want to. And from that process, we learned some really cool things about how the model works at Reynolds Creek. So compared to the, the MIMICS model that was run across the LTER sites, um, the decomposition rate, the kinetics 
for um, breaking down litter with the microbial community are much faster at Reynolds Creek in the model, about four times faster. Um, microbial CUE um, is much lower, so it's, it's offsetting that, that decomposition speed um, by reducing how much carbon is actually transferring from microbes to a soil organic matter, it's increasing respiration. And then we're also able to kind of further dial in the, the turnover time for, for soil organic matter, especially the protected samples. We're able to get those up again with known and theorized limits around 100 years or more. Uh, so once we dial in those parameters, we have all this data. Um, here are the, the points on these two plots. The, the gray points show the, the default, what we call the kind of originally published mimic parameters versus this new machine learning parameterization that we, we came up with. Um, and we're, we're able to get really robust predictions here. We have um, correlations of, of about 0.8 and our root mean square error is, is in the ballpark of the error we see just from sampling soil carbon out of the watershed from your left foot to your right foot, just that variability you get is quite similar to the, the square error we're seeing. So one of the other cool things we've been able to do with, you know, we're pumping all of this data and we're able to use machine learning. We're able to go and look at how many different parameterizations produce similarly accurate estimates by our kind of statistical measures of soil carbon. So this plot here shows 30 different parameterizations that all have a similar correlation and a similar root mean square error. And you can see that there's a decent amount of variability in these points on how accurate um, MIMICS is predicting soil carbon. So I'm sorry, I've, I left off the axis title. The, the bottom axis on this plot is, is field measured soil carbon and the, the Y axis is, is MIMICS estimate. Um, so th this is kind of to be expected. It gives us some idea, but the really cool stuff being a process model, right? Because then we can dive in we can say, well, where is this variability coming from and how variable are all the pools and processes underneath these soil carbon stock estimates? So we can see how much does parameterization of the model affect estimates of protected soil organic matter pools? How much you know, does it affect litter C stocks, microbial C, you know, soil, soil organic carbon turnover times? And we can look at how important this parameterization is, even when you know, going back to plot A here, by a statistical measure, all of these are good estimates that, that you, you're not able to separate and say one of these is better than another. So what we're left with, the, the big advance in this is that we're back to needing more data, right? We can now use data for, for um, protected soil carbon, for mineral associated soil carbon, for litter sea stocks, for microbial pools to help us dial in where the model should be predicting these pools. So it's kind of come full circle. We started with soda to get the data to be able to do this. And now where we're really ending up in this project is saying, well, we can produce pretty good estimates, but to make them better, we need more data. And this is the type of data we need and exactly where we can apply it in the model to improve confidence in, in model estimates and projections. So kind of a, another cool facet of the study, since we used all the spatial data and our estimates were so robust and we had such good spatial um, replication, we're able to make these, these really high resolution maps of soil carbon, as well as the estimate standard deviation that comes from that variability in the model parameterization. So here we're, we're mapping soil carbon across Reynolds Creek at a resolution of 10 meters squared, um, which gets us really down close to the scale of measurements. So when we get data in the future for mineral associated organic carbon or litter stocks or any of those things, we're able to directly line that up with the, with the model estimates at the same scale. And then since it's a process based model, we can kind of go hog wild with these maps. So we can, we can then also map the model estimates of different soil carbon pools. And we can also have some fun playing around with different scenarios by applying, you know, a, a change in gross primary productivity or a change in soil temperature. We can see kind of the magnitude of effect on soil carbon that the model predicts. And again, you know, the bottom half of all these plots, we can also look at how much model parameterization is um, kind of leading to, to variability in those estimates. Um, and, and this is where hopefully in the future as we, we're able to get more data, we can, we can bring down that variability in the estimate while also having more confidence in you know, ensuring the estimate is correct. So that's some of the, the awesome science I've been working on and things that are, are coming down the pipe from SOTA, but the, the big 
kind of lesson here, the big point I wanted to come back to is that all of that work really started with soda. It, it was the ability to synthesize that data allowed us to kind of see what we had to work with and then really let the, the scientific process do its work and, and take the expertise of everyone involved and, and, and lead to a paper we're quite excited about. And without the tools that, that we built with soda, I, I don't think we ever would have gotten there. We would, we would have never seen how much we had to work with. Um, so synthesis can be a really powerful foundation for, for studies you, you, you don't even really envision yet. So the second application, so as, we're, as I'm moving on from that project, I've recently been funded on another um, for the Critical Zone Network um, Geomicrobiology um, Group. And it's really kind of uh, just one more time to, to run SOTA through the, this process and cycle of improvement and bringing in data and new insights. And it's really exciting with the Geomicrobiology Project because we're, we're going to kind of get at so much more of critical zone data where this is a chance to expand soda from being a soil data harmonization network really probably up to like an environmental you know science data harmonization network and we're on the tools to to better um kind of collect and synthesize data that's not just soil that's from you know sensors spatial data um all these these other facets of the study while also continuing to improve on the foundation. You know, some, some questions came up about Google Drive pros and cons and the error involved with key files. And as this continues to be used, this is really where the term framework is starting to take hold. We're realizing that as, you know, people from the project, myself included, continue to use these tools, we really have something that, that's building and gaining steam and attention that hopefully can, can become an off the shelf tool for data synthesis that others can use. Um, so, NC's project was kind of this great start, and we're seeing this um, really exciting future for continuing to use these tools. That's all that I have for the day. Um, I think now, yeah, we got a little bit of time for questions, and uh, happy to hear what we, folks think. Yeah, we do indeed, Derek. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. um, I, you, you don't get to hear all the clapping out there, but I'm sure it's happening. Um, so we have a, a couple that came in early. Uh, Renee is asking about the pros and cons of using Google Drive, and Stephen answered some of that. In uh, and I'm actually going to just make Stephen a co-host as well, so he can join the uh, the discussion. And um, and Jim Clern asks about some idea of the effort involved in terms of FTEs or months required to harmonize and aggregate the data sets. tack on a little bit to the first question about Google Drive, um, something I encountered as using Soda for Reynolds Creek was that Google's actively developing Google Drive and Google Sheets and all these things. These aren't, you know, set in stone products that are out there. Um, and they change things frequently. And those changes can then just completely just wipe out all of the all of the coding tools that we've built. Um, and, and without, yeah, unless you're paying really close attention, you, you don't even know. So in our case, we, we left Soda, we got done, I got my postdoc, came back six months later and nothing worked. Um, so, so that's, it, it's, some, it's a piece of the project that's out of your control that has the ability to completely level it and make it non-usable. Um, so, so that's, you know, beyond just the difficulty of, the, of getting the data back and forth from Google Drive, it also has the potential to, to really throw a wrench in it. So I'm going to take the liberty of asking a follow-up question there. Are you converting to a different system moving forward? Yes, I plan to. Um, <laughs> what <What'd> you, <laughs> would you do for Reynolds Creek, Derek? Um, so still using Google Drive, but instead of trying to use R to go to Google Drive, just, just downloading the data locally and working from that copy. We, we had discussed that previously and, and there's, there's cons in that as well, is that you don't, you don't get updates. When you download it, you take a snapshot in time and you've now disconnected the people that are providing data. If they come back with an updated version or anything, it, you're not getting it. Um, in practice, we haven't seen that problem manifest near as much as the problems we've had manifest from Google Drive. Yeah. So 
uh, that's the, the simple solution is still use Google Drive to, to connect and get data and make it easy because it is so widely used, but disconnect soda from pulling directly from Google Drive. Well, and one of the other things that Stephen worked on is kind of a uh, as part of this project was to you know part of so part of our synthesis effort was to to help people publish the data that haven't been published already, and so you know ideally moving forward those data would already be published, and so if you were accessing published data that were on EDI, for example, then grabbing the raw data isn't necessarily an issue anymore, and you just need to somehow link up the raw data with your you know, the metadata template, which doesn't have to be on, done on Google Drive, that can be done you know, in some other way. But that, I think that's the other challenge with trying to kind of capture this long tail of soil data, you know, data from places like the Calhoun that go back to the 70s um, that, are, that may or may not be published um, or, or tricky to deal with. Right. Uh, so anybody want to tackle Jim's question? I Stephen answered it from one <laughs> perspective in text, but um, to get to where we are now, it was a lot. It took a ton <laughs> of effort from you know mostly the three of us, but but even you know time in the room. You know, we had twenty two people at our first meeting, and twenty two people times a week of time times. Yeah, you know, so it took a long time just to like get people filling out those metadata templates, but then um, actually using like, you know, writing the scripts and, and harmonizing the data took a lot of effort from, you know, mostly from the three of us. And then on top of it, Derek spent a ton of time making the, not a ton of time, the shiny script he kind of like did in a week coming to visit me in Boulder, which was fun. <laughs> Look what I did. Um, now that it's built, I think, like Derek said, it's it's much easier to use and it's easier to manipulate. Um, you know, you can add new fields, you can change, you know, change stuff around. Um, but getting here was kind of brutal. <laughs> I should probably add one of the things that has made this group particularly successful. I think is the requirement to have an information manager yep. uh, and a technical liaison as part of the group. It makes a huge difference. Yep. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to add. Like having Stephen is not a soil biogeochemist, um, and mm -hmm. his time on the project really made like we couldn't have been here if it wasn't for the the work that Stephen put in. That was huge. Uh, yes, so we have from Claire Buffal. Do the different model parameterizations produce different or similar maps of each output variable? answer that one pretty quick by pulling this back up here. Um, so this map here um, is actually produced from the average of those 30 kind of best fit parameterizations. Um, and then this map is the standard deviation from that. So, so this map here actually is showing how much those those maps differ if you were to make one for each parameterization and take the standard deviation at each you know, 10 meter squared grid cell. Um, so you can see how much they, the parameterizations lead to differences in different areas in the landscape. This is the, the southern region of the watershed is the higher elevation region. So we have more variability as we get more productivity. Um, and then down here, we also get huge differences in soil temperature from aspect effects. So we, we get more variability in our estimates from soil temperature. Um, so hopefully that, that kind of shows what kind of what we're trying to get at here is how much things can vary from those parameterizations. And it's, it's you know, a, a decent amount, but it's not, I wouldn't say a concerning amount that the estimates are still fairly tight between those parameterizations. Um, but it, it's very nice to know how big those differences are. Thanks, Derek. And from Samantha Weintraub. Um, I, this might be a plant, I think, in order to give you an opportunity to talk <laughs> about one of the other papers. Um, so thanks, Will and Derek, for great talks. I've been finding similar challenges when trying to combine data sets within NEON sites, dealing with different depths and spatiotemporal resolutions across different plant soil flux measurements is hugely difficult. I wonder if the community needs some best practice guidelines around this, or is that impossible and it's specific to each project network or data set? Yeah, this is such a hard, <laughs> it's such a hard topic. Like figuring out how to aggregate data appropriately um, is really tricky. And and Sam and I didn't communicate before this. 
it's, the question is all on her own. Um, I, I, I don't really know. I think I'm still struggling with it to figure out how best to aggregate data. And I think it is kind of question specific, you know, for some questions, you might be totally happy to aggregate all the data across a given LTER or NEON site um, to look at broader kind of eco-climatological gradients. Um, but you lose a lot of information by kind of blasting away that with insight variability. Um, but then if you keep that with insight variability, it's challenging because a lot of times the measurements aren't taken at the same spatial or temporal resolution with one another. So if you've got, you know, inorganic nitrogen transformations that are taken quarterly at one set of plots and then soil temperature that's measured continuously at a different, you know, at different locations in the landscape, um, it's hard to figure out how to, how to align those two. And I think that's where we're still kind of struggling with soda is, you know, we've got measurements of productivity and measurements of soil carbon but they were taken at different times by different people at different places. And is it okay to line those up? And if so, do you have to aggregate, how do you, how do you aggregate to account for some of that with insight variation? Um, yeah, I think maybe some best practices, you know, if, if you're having this problem with neon, it's not gonna get any better with any other network. Um, I think the problems is, are gonna be more acute. So um, that's one where maybe, yeah, have, getting some, Getting some, some smart people in the room with creative ideas would be helpful. Yeah, there was uh, the group did actually put out a paper with suggestions about right. what sorts of things non soil scientists should be measuring that would help in terms of um, just having the data in the first place. Yeah, yeah, you know, and one of the other, so that's, that's uh, Sharon's paper. And you know the thing that you have to measure is bulk density, which almost nobody does, and it's even harder to do well. But that's kind of the critical piece in terms of measurements. Um, and then the other side of it would be, uh, you know, Mark Bradford has a nice paper that's in the special issue that Samantha and I led that's talking about you know the spatial grain of your measurements and how that kind of influences the inferences that you might make from it. Um, and so some of the preliminary work that we have from a macro systems project is, is looking at that question. Um, and, and you get really different answers if you aggregate data um, into, it, it, it somehow it, it, biases your, it biases the results that you get depending on how you aggregate the data, um, which is troubling, so. Um, and then Catherine Rochi has a, a question in the chat. It's relatedly, how do you manage the different measurement methods for things like soil organic matter fractionation and soil phosphorus that different people use? <laughs> uh, yeah, so for fractions, we intentionally left those out of SODA because that was what ISRAD was supposed to be doing. So ISRAD started as being kind of me measuring carbon fractions, and then they transitioned a little bit to doing more radiocarbon of fractions. Um, so soda doesn't have much fraction data, although if you did, the method would be critical. And then, but phosphorus was the other one. Um, and people that measure phosphorus are passionate about the ways that it's measured. And it usually is, you know, it makes sense for the ecosystems they're studying why they measure, measure it with Hadley versus Bray um, P. And the database has a tab in there for you to select the method that it was measured by. Um, so that way, if you want to compare, if you only if you only care about Bray P, you're only looking at measurements of Bray P that were measured with that technique. Um, so that's one, and, and because we didn't collect fractions and we weren't focused on phosphorus, there's not a ton of those data in our database, but the, you know, the hooks are there in the metadata template to, to include that kind of information. I'll tack on the, the the size of soda is actually really cool for those method questions that come up a lot where it's hard to get enough data to really say, are these methods comparable? So one thing we do have some of, um, again, what I wish we had more is a common one that comes up with soil carbon is whether it was done by an elemental analysis or Walkley Black. Um, and loss so, on ignition, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So so with a with the synthesized data set, you know, 360,000 rows, it, it's, you know, becoming one of the best tools we have to kind of look at those differences spatially and see if it's a huge red flag to lump that data together or not. Um, 
So in the future, it could be something that you know builds as well for for phosphorus methods and whatnot. Is actually bringing together the, those data from different methods and being able to compare them. Yep. Yeah, I, I wish I had a quarter for every hour that I was spent in Santa Barbara talking about phosphorus fractionations. Um, this is not the first data <laughs> synthesis effort that went through NCs that we talked about that. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, those methodological concerns are critical here, so. Thanks. Uh, and we've got one more from Jeff Blanchard, who I should note uh, will be our speaker next month. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the soil carbon and nitrogen Nitrogen grass were nice in addition to pH and clay. Did you look at soil moisture or temperature? Um, yes, I think from Emily's work, what I recall was that those soil properties were by far the most robust predictor of soil stoichiometry um, compared to what I would expect, which are things like climate and litter quality, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, the model that Derek was talking about, MIMICS, definitely focuses on climate and litter quality and controlling soil seed end ratios. And, Emily's data suggests that's not the case. So it's good, good, good to learn from. Awesome. Uh, any last questions from folks? If not, we're coming up on the end of the hour and we'll just say thank you so much to Will and Derek. It was a great presentation. Much appreciated. Thanks. Thanks.